Have you ever had a time in your life where you were absolutely convinced you were moving in the right direction? And you might have invested a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of resources in different things. And as you did that, you were just convinced this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is what God has for me. And it doesn't work out. And you realize, oh, my gosh, maybe I didn't have it right. I'd like to tell you three situations of how people just didn't get it right, but they so thought they did. Years ago, when I was at a, a church, back in my younger days, if somebody wanted to get married, I would not do the wedding ceremony unless they saw me for my infinite wisdom for three premarital counseling sessions. And a seminary professor pointed out along the way, he said, you know, when you think about it, some people have been run off from the church because the minister that they wanted to marry them made them come to counseling and pushed them too hard. What if you just help people who ask you for help? And it changed my perspective. But back in the days where you had to come for three sessions or I would not do your ceremony, this, this couple came in. The first time they came in, they sat down. I knew her. This was the first time I met him. We'll call them Beth and Gary. And I slid over two tablets and pens and said, without looking at each other's papers, would each of you just jot down three character traits? that you think are most important in the person you're about to marry. And they scribbled and they thought and they scribbled and they thought and they scribbled and they finally got it down. And I looked at him and said, what characteristics are most important to you for a wife? And he read them. I think, how's she doing? Man, she is everything I've ever wanted. Perfect. And I came to her and I said, what did you write down? And she told me what she wrote down, and I looked at him, and I said, how do you measure up to these? And he said, I'm not any of those. And I looked at her and said, this looks kind of like a mismatch. He's not what you're looking for according to what you wrote down and according to what he said. And we kept it as light as we could, but finally got around to, why do you want to marry him? Because I love him, but he's not what you want. How are you going to resolve this? She said, I think he will become what I want him to become. And we finished that session, and we did the next two, and I did the wedding service. And as was evident from the first time, it was rough, and it didn't work, and it didn't last. These people were sincere. They believed in each other. They were willing to get married. They were willing to vow, to love, to honor, to cherish, to respect in sickness and health and poverty and wealth until death do us part but it didn't work. They invested their time, their energy, and their resources. They gave it all they had, but they just missed it. And then I think about a time when I was in college. I was a junior. I was starting to take more and more classes in my major, which was management. And I had Dean Richard Scott. He was in charge. He was the dean of the Hancomer School of Business at Baylor University. I wanted to do well in that class. His tests were projects. He would give us different case studies. And we were supposed to be consultants and tell the companies what to do, to write a paper on that. Well, I wrote my paper. I turned it in. The next class period we came back, they had all been graded. I made a C. I was not happy at all with that. So he had the two students in the class that had made A's talk to the class and tell them why they recommended what they recommended. Well, they'd done a lot of projections, a lot of numbers, a lot of metrics, all kinds of things like that. They had lots of paperwork done and they made the A's. And he said, for the rest of you, this is something you could should consider. You should do projections on something like this and just be sure the numbers are going to work. Well, that's what 
worked for that case study. The next time around, we get another case study. Well, I learned the first time he likes projections. So I did all of these long-term projections, just like the people made A's the first time and did the projections of how it's going to work, how it's going to be successful. And he handed the papers back. I made an F on that one with about 80% of the rest of the class. Now, this guy's not Dean because of political connections. He was Dean because he was a good teacher. He was brutal. He was tough. But he said, let me guess what happened. And there are a lot of you that are very unhappy with your grades. But from this case study, it's very evident to me and to the A students, this company would never, ever get to the long run unless they survive the short run. Most businesses go under because they're uncapitalized and they die. Most new businesses die within the first five years. They don't make it through the short run. You have to go through the short run to get to the long run. Well, I've done all my projections. He didn't want projections. He wanted a short-term plan to get this company out of trouble. So I failed to save the company. I so fall after that first C, I've cracked the code. I've got it. Now, I want to look at somebody in the Bible that you know well. His name is the Apostle Paul. In Philippians, the third chapter, he describes how right he thought he was. He gives us seven reasons why he thinks he's so right, but it took a personal confrontation with Jesus, being blinded for three days, having a total, complete conversion experience to realize everything he had believed all of his life, and he grew up in the synagogue, he grew up in church, he missed it. We're getting into a series within a series. We're doing the Sermon on the Mount. It's only three chapters of Matthew. We will probably be there until the end of the spring, maybe into the summer, but it's the best of Jesus. But he started out so light. We start out with the Beatitudes. Blessed, happy, overjoyed on the inside are those, and he gave us eight different things we can do to be truly, deeply happy, the happiness that no person could take away because it's internal, not external. And then once he's told us how to be happy, he said, now that you got that, go out and be salt and light to the world. And then he comes along and he tells us in the next lesson, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And now for the next six weeks, he starts each of these lessons by saying this, this is Matthew 5, verse 21. You're going to hear this six different times from this chapter. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever mur murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, this is what we're going to hear six times. You have heard that it's said to those of old, but I say to you, he's not coming to abolish the law. He's not coming to say don't murder. He's coming to take it to a much deeper level and get us back to what God intended when he gave us the law. So we read on here, verse 22, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. To put this in simple terms, the thesis of the next six lessons is God is more concerned about the inside of you than the outside of you. 
the Pharisees, these people that Jesus was trying to correct, were very conscious of what other people thought of them. I live most of my life trying to win the approval of people. It's wrong. The Apostle Paul had to deal with that. Galatians 1.10, the Apostle Paul wrote, am I still trying to seek the approval of people or of God? If I'm trying to get the approval of people, I cannot be a bondservant of Christ. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God in the things of this world. It's either or. Now, Apostle Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, I want to go over some of that with you. He so thought he was right, and he had all these good reasons to think he was right. He had seven reasons. Four of these reasons that he lists here, he inherited. And then three of these reasons he developed on his own. So he says, we'll go back to verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Now, this is one of the differences in Christians and the Pharisees. The Pharisees thought they could do it on their own by keeping the rules. Christians recognize I got to have God's help to do it. I can't do it in my own strength. I can't do it on my own power. So we learn to lean on him. So Paul starts in this list of all the qualifications he has. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's a big deal to Jewish people. That meant he was not a proselyte. His parents took him, fulfilled the ritual of circumcision that they were supposed to do exactly on the eighth day. So he got off to a real good start when he was eight days old. He did the right thing. His parents did it for him. He inherited it of the people of Israel. So he's Jewish. He is of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. So he's been circumcised. He is Jewish. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was one of two out of the 12 tribes that never, ever departed from the right protocols in the temple, and they stayed with the law. They're two out of 12. He was one of those tribes. It's a real uh, highly respected tribe for him to be from. And then emphasize that he was Jewish once again. He said, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. That basically meant both of his parents, not just one, were Jewish people. So he's got that. These are the four things he was looking at that he inherited. Then he names these three things that he earned. As to the law, a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the strictest sect of the Jewish people. They took the Ten Commandments. They blew it up to 613 rules and re regulations. They were wealthy. They were academic. They were educated. They were highly respected. They knew the scripture forward and backwards. He was a Pharisee, but not only was he a Pharisee, he had a lot of zeal. He was a zealous Pharisee. I mean, to extremes, he said, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So he thinks, okay, I'm a Pharisee. That's as high as you can go spiritually. But I'm just not an academic Pharisee who knows the scripture. I'm an activist. I'm finding Christians. I'm taking them out, and I'm stoning them to death because they are a cult that we have to get rid of. And then he says, as far as the law goes, I am blameless. I am without sin. You can't hang anything on me. So he's thinking, I've kept all of the law all of the time. I'm as good as I can be. And God was just not happy with that. He totally, completely missed it. So this is where we go back to Matthew. There are three things that... 
Jesus is trying to teach us to help us in those first two verses and their couplets. We've got two verses, two verses, and two verses. The first two verses that we looked at here basically are for you to feel better on the inside. Not only to not murder, but to let go of your anger. Then the second two verses in Matthew 5, he talks about if somebody else has a problem with you, it's your responsibility to help them feel better about your relationship with them. He said, take care of yourself first, get the bad feelings out of yourself, then go help people who have bad feelings about you in them. This is advanced stuff. This is serious Christianity. And he's telling us to do it because he wants our lives to be better. And then he said, if somebody is taking you to court, if somebody's really coming after you hard, settle matters with them quickly. Make it urgent. Don't put it off. Deal with it immediately. God regards relationships very, very much. Those are what's important to him. So he's trying to help us with this. Paul missed it. Here's the bottom line that I'll boil it down to. The Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, very highly respected, very legalistic, very black and white, had shifted from the love of God to making it all about the law of God. They were rule keepers. They shifted from the rules away from the relationship with God to the rules of God. And this is evident when Jesus starts speaking them. They could hate people. Now, psychologically, there's a progression. It starts with anger. And if we hang on to anger enough, long enough, it will become hatred. And hatred is what leads to murder. So Jesus is going back down to the beginnings. He's trying to say, hey, God wants you to be loving people. Jesus summed it all up. He said, if you'd like to fulfill all of the law and all of the prophets, love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love yourself, love your neighbor, love God. That's it. He wants us to be about love. But these people are just about the rules. So that basically means... I could attack one of you, knock you unconscious, find something sharp about to cut your jugular vein, and people in the crowd pull me off and say, hey, we're cool. I've done nothing wrong. He or she is still alive. I didn't murder her. I didn't break the law. Well, Jesus was going after that kind of attitude. No, you hurt them severely. That's not all right. I want you to love them. Not only can you not murder them, you're going to be in trouble. You will be in trouble because of your anger. Hear this again. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Now we're talking about a civil court there, the Jewish court. And if you murder somebody, they'll take you to court and they will put you to death, probably by stoning, because you broke God's law. But Jesus adds to that. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. This word for insults in the original language is raka. The theologians say it's very hard to translate. It basically carries the idea of empty. So if I say Raka, you are empty headed. You are empty of any good thing. There's nothing in you. It was a very derogatory statement. If you insult your brother, you're liable to the council. And whoever says you fool, that's the Greek word moros. That's where we get our English word moron. So if I call you a moron, it gets pretty stout. 
will be liable to the hell of fire. So there's a lot to break down here. When you think about that statement, the hell of fire, the word hell there is Gehenna. Gehenna comes from the word Hymnon. And there was the valley of Hymnon. Well, back in the days of bad king Ahab, they would go to the valley of Hymnon and they would sacrifice babies. They would throw them in the fire. They'd build a huge fire. And to appease this god Molech, they would take their babies and throw them in this fire and watch them burn to death. Evil, evil, evil. When Josiah became king, he declared that that place would be cursed forever. It became the garbage dump of Jerusalem and is to this day. And fires burn there all the time. That's what they did with their trash. They'd take it outside. It's southwest of Jerusalem, and they would burn their trash there. It was constantly burning. That's what he's saying. So if you're angry, you're going to set yourself up for burning on the inside. Let me break this down psychologically. In your human experience, you have two primal emotions. It's pretty simple. One feels good, one feels bad. Now, the Bible calls the good one love and the bad one fear. I think every good feeling is rooted in love. Every bad feeling is rooted in fear. Human beings are typically motivated by fear or love. You get to choose which ones you'd like to be motivated by. I lived the first half of my life or more motivated, driven by fear. And when you think about the fear that's going on, it's it's... It's there all the time. I was afraid of every. I was afraid of what people think. I was afraid I wouldn't be perfect. I was afraid I wouldn't get the job done. I was afraid I wouldn't get the promotion. I wouldn't get the raise. I wouldn't progress. I wouldn't this. I got married the first time because I was afraid she'd get away and I wouldn't find anybody better. And I remember when one of my mother's good friends, we were at Baylor Hospital. My father had had a heart attack. She was a beautiful girl. We were just dating at the time. And this friend said, I don't know how serious he is about her, but if he wants to marry her, he better put a ring on her finger because all of these young doctors sure have been paying a lot of attention to her. Boom. Fear. Scared. Not a good reason to get married. Fear of loss rather than purely loving someone. So he's saying, hey, anger is fear-based. Well, years ago, I brought Dr. Harvey Davison in to the church where I was working at the time, Cliff Temple Baptist Church, to do a lecture. He's my psychological mentor, the most brilliant psychologist I've ever seen in my life. I've been around John Gray, Tony Robbins, Wayne Dyer. They're good. They're really good. But this guy was just a genius. And he had such vast, fascinating experience. He had worked with special forces for the United States government. He'd worked with some black ops. He'd worked with people in prison for multiple murders. He understood people well. And one thing he said in that conference is he's never seen anybody kill the right person. And I thought, where's he going with this? This was, this was so long ago. This was when the Dallas Cowboys had won the Super Bowl. If you can remember back that far, we had a big parade downtown Dallas. The whole city was excited. We were so happy we won. Dallas used to be America's team, and it was happy, happy, happy times. But there were some young black men downtown that couldn't stand all the joy and the happiness while the parade was going on. They started a riot. They started knocking windows out. They started looting stores. They started stealing from people, grabbing purses. They just were out of control. He said, let me explain what's going on there. They really didn't have any reason to be so angry because the Cowboys won, but they were. He said, let's go back to when they were small children. Just imagine a little three or four-year-old boy. He's grown up in a single-parent home. He's living in the government projects. His mama is all he's got. 
And one day mama brings home a new boyfriend and they're having a great time. They're getting along. They start drinking. They drink a little bit too much. He starts getting nasty and he starts getting violent and he starts hitting mom. This little boy tries to protect his mom. He's only this tall. He runs between them and tries to separate them. The first time, the man just pushes him away. The second time, when the man's hitting his mother again, he rushes in there, and this time the guy backhands him, knocks him against the wall, bangs his head against the wall, bloodies his nose, knocks a tooth out, and threatens him. This little boy is thinking, I'm going to kill him. He is a threat to my mother. I've got to kill him. It's from Dr. Davis, and I learned the only time people ever really make lasting, significant change is when they make new decisions in states of deep or high emotion. That little boy's making a decision. I need to kill that man. He's a threat to my life, to my family. He's a bad person. He needs to go. Loads up that program. I'd like to kill somebody. Dr. Davison said, this is probably what happened. These boys grew up with such rough, rough lives. Along the way, they made a decision to kill. And if they join a gang, they're probably going to have to follow through on their decision to kill. Because if you join a gang, a lot of the initiations, you got to kill somebody. So sooner or later, they make a decision to kill. He said, that's why I say nobody's ever killed the wrong person. Now, watch this. Anger leads to hatred. If we angry long enough, we'll start to hate somebody. And hatred is what leads to murder. God's taken us back. Deal with the anger. James said it so well. Do not be angry and don't sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. God's saying, hey, your life is going to be so much better. Don't stay angry with people. Deal with the anger. So this is the first thing he tells us to do. Not only are you guilty if you murder them, you're in trouble. You are in trouble on the inside if you're angry with your brother. He doesn't want you to do that. Anger feels bad. Think about it. When you're loving something, how good you feel. It may be you're loving your lunch today. It may be you're loving your best friend today. It may be you're in love with somebody romantic and you just float on clouds. Your, your feet are about six inches above the ground. You're feeling so good. Love feels good. Fear feels really, really, really bad. He's saying get rid of the anger. It's fear-based. It feels bad to you. Then he says, now that you've dealt with yourself, I want you to care about other people. And if somebody is upset because of you, doesn't matter if you've done anything wrong or not. Go help them feel better. Go talk to them. Deal with them before you go to God. Really? We're supposed to deal with other people before we sacrifice and give gifts to God? That's what Jesus said. Now picture this. It's probably that time of the year. It's one of the feasts. It's one of the times. Maybe it's Passover. You're going to make your sacrifice to God. You've got your dove. You've got your lamb. You've got your sacrificial animal. You take it to the priest. The priest is about to sacrifice this animal on your behalf. And he's got the knife in the air. He's about to cut its throat. And it's like, oh, priest, stop. I need to leave this here because God reminded me one of my brothers has something against me. Somebody I know has something. I didn't do anything wrong, priest, but that person doesn't like me. I got to go deal with that before I make my offering. Can I just leave my, my, my dove here? Can I just leave my lamb here? Can I leave my bull here while I go deal with this? Jesus knows what he's talking about. He's putting some pressure on these people of how important this is to God. And then the third thing we look at, the last two verses, 25 and 6, says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. God knows how he made people. You are a spirit. You have a soul. 
you live in a body. I think one of the best definitions of flesh is a combination of our body and our soul working together. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotion. Your spirit has three functions too. It's your communion with God. It's your conscience of what's right and what's wrong. And it's your intuition. So psychologically, we can easily convince ourselves, I don't have to deal with that person. That person's a jerk. They lie. They cheat. They steal. I don't have to have anything to do with them because they're just a bad person. That will work for your soul, but your spirit, where your conscience is, is God's spirit always telling you the difference between right and wrong. Unforgiveness is wrong. Forgiveness is right. Judgment is wrong. Non-judgment is right. Reconciliation is right. Staying in a dispute is wrong. And there's no way you can get around from that. Now, you can quench your spirit. You can harden your heart. You can do things like that. You can have a calloused spirit, a calloused conscience, but your spirit knows right from wrong. Your spirit's intuitive. Intuition is when you know things from God that do not come to you through your five senses. Intuition is going to be saying, you need to go make this right. You need to settle it quickly. So oftentimes we just want to push that aside and not deal with it. But God says, deal with it quickly. Don't let it go on and on because it's going to cost you. It's not going to go well. Deal with it as quickly as you can. So we look at these things. He's saying, hey, God cares how you feel. We're going to look at a couple other verses in Hosea 6.6. 6. We're not going to be here too long. It's hard to find. But this is what it says. God is speaking, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Well, most of the people of this day would rather sacrifice, get another lamb, another dove, another bushel of grain, some kind of offering and sacrifice for their sins than just love people. And you know, if you're loving people, you're probably not going to be sinning. Love extinguishes sin. You know, we wouldn't need the Ten Commandments if we just said, hey, love everybody. The Ten Commandments are just different ways to express that love by not doing wrong things of, you know, remember the Sabbath. Keep it this is how we love God. If we just love God, our fellow man and ourselves, we wouldn't sin. And God is saying this. He's saying, hey, it's I really don't want sacrifice. I want steadfast love. This is the chesed love mentioned in the Old Testament. It's the, the everlasting love of God. It's his mercy. It's his grace. It's desire for goodness to come to people. And he wants the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. He says, hey, you can burn those things all day long. That's not what I want. I want you to get to know me. Read the Bible, study me, listen to me, speak with me, have a relationship with me. He's about the relationships more than the rules. He's about the love more than the law. This is what he's looking for us. Now in Micah, just a few pages over, chapter 6, verse 8. This is bottom line stuff. This is about God. God has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But just three things. To love justice. To love kindness. Again, this would go back to that cohesed love of God. Love justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Their spiritual leaders did not practice this. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were not into justice. They were wealthy. They were proud. 
They were arrogant, brilliant, steady, sincere, but they missed what God was looking for here. And so for the next six Bible studies we have, Jesus is going through these hot topics and trying to take these topics and say, this is how the Pharisees perverted God's law, but this is what God really intends. Every one of these, Jesus is going to point out, God is not looking on the outside. He's looking on the inside. First Samuel, you probably know it well. It's worth hearing again. First Samuel 16, 7, the second part. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. This is a huge challenge for all of us. It's easier to deal with the outside. We can go to the gym and work out. We can diet. We can have cosmetic surgery. We can color our hair. We can dress ourselves up. We can live in nicer houses, drive nicer cars, and get everything looking so good on the outside. But God's not really paying much attention to that. He's saying, what's in your heart? What is in your heart? Do you need to redecorate? Do you need to gut your heart and have a designer come in and make it nice and pretty? I've remodeled a couple of houses in my lifetime and really enjoyed doing that. We got rid of the old and we brought in the new. We updated it. We upgraded it. We made it the way we wanted it to be. That was fun. Why not redecorate, redesign your heart and get it the way that God wants it to be? He says, man, get rid of the bad stuff. Bring in new, good, beautiful stuff. Because when this is your primary focus, it's not at risk. When your exterior world is your primary focus, you are at risk. We're in a dicey economy. We're in a dicey political situation. We're in a dicey global situation. We don't know how long freedom is going to exist. We don't know how long this country is going to exist as we have known it. But if we're right on the inside, we're going to be just fine. We're going to be like Paul and Silas, who they've been wrongly arrested, stripped of their citizenship, stripped of their clothes, beaten publicly in front of everybody, battered, bruised, bloody in a prison, chained to a Roman dungeon walls in the last guy's urine and feces. It was a despicable place. What are they doing? They're singing praises to God. They're happy on the inside. The inside had become more important to them than the outside. Therefore, they didn't come totally, completely undone when the outside of their world collapsed. God quickly restored it, too. So when you make God's priorities your priorities, everything gets so, so much better. We'll wrap it up with this story. In 1905, O. Henry wrote a short story. O. Henry was, the rumor has it, was at Pete's Tavern when he wrote this. Just a short story. The Gift of the Magi. It's about two young people. These young people are married. They dearly love each other. They are really, really poor folks. They are just barely struggling by. It's Christmas Eve, and they don't have their gifts for each other. They don't have much money. All she's got is $1.87. 60 cents of that is in pennies. And she's found the pennies because she's gone to the busy markets where people are always trampling around and it's dangerous to get down on the ground and look for fallen change. And she's picked up a lot. She's saved up. She's got $1.87. She's counted it again and again and again on Christmas Eve, but it doesn't grow every time she counts it. So she's got $1.87. She wants something for her husband. She goes to one of the local salons and she had long, gorgeous thick, beautiful hair, and she sold her hair for $20. That would be equivalent to about $700 in today's monetary standard. She sold her beautiful hair. His prized possession was a pocket watch, but he'd never been able to afford a chain to put it on. So she sells her hair, gets the money, 
buys the best chain she could possibly find for him. And she goes home. Well, he comes in from work on Christmas Eve. She immediately confesses and said, I sold my hair today because I want you to have this. And she presents him with the chain. He said, today, I sold my gold pocket watch so I could buy you these beautiful ornamental clips for your fabulous hair. That's one of the saddest stories I've ever heard. It's great that they loved each other and they sacrificed, but it just didn't work out the way they thought it would. Just as with Paul, it didn't work out the way he thought it would. Just as with all of us, we think we know God. We think we're doing life right, but maybe we've missed something. So over the next six weeks, we're going to look at these tough things that Jesus talks about, like anger and lust, and divorce, and oaths, and retaliation. If that's not bad enough, and love for your enemies. <laughs> he wants us to become people of love. So the harder we get squeezed, the more love will flow out of us.